Hello and welcome to another video from the only source of information that you need to not only survive the current apocalypse but actually enjoy it. And today I'm going to be talking about how our modern Bibles have been altered over the thousands of years of time since they were originally put into print and the effects that those alterations have had on the accuracy of our English translations. The question of whether or not our Bibles can be trusted comes up quite often. And it's becoming fairly common for me to have to explain in a few short sentences why the overall teachings of the Bible can, in fact, be trusted. But I've never really been comfortable with that. I always feel like the short version isn't really enough. As someone who has read the Bible all the way through many times from beginning to end, I can say with confidence that although it is very easy to defend any church doctrine that you can think of, using individual scriptures, not one doctrinal teaching of any religion is supported by the Bible when taken as a whole. If you, like myself, are one of those people that has read the Bible all the way through, then you probably already know what I'm talking about. Anytime someone starts posting proof text of some Christian teaching, it instantly comes across to those of us who are well-versed in the Bible as nonsense. Those who believe that the genocides conducted by the empire or a good thing will always quote some bit of scripture about David's soldiers going out and killing a whole bunch of people, as if God approves of murder. But you will never hear such a person mention God's law, which clearly states, Thou shalt not kill. None of those who support civilization can ever explain in any kind of reasonable way what Jesus meant when at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 and 10, He said that we were to pray for God's kingdom to come. They simply are not able to accept God's promise to soon put an end to the insane carnal warfare that humans indulge in as they struggle over who gets to claim ownership of the earth's natural resources. Obviously, those who indulge in such conflicts are not interested in praying for God's kingdom to come, but are more concerned with defending the kingdoms that already exist. It would not be logical to believe that someone willing to fight to the death in defense of one of mankind's governments would be, would be willing to live under God's appointed ruler, Jesus Christ. No one who reads the Bible from cover to cover with an open mind would ever come to the conclusion that God approves of death and destruction. Only someone that's been trained by the satanic cults of Christianity, Judaism, and atheism would believe that the Bible supports such demon-inspired nonsense. It must be admitted that even those who read the Bible regularly have to struggle to put into words what the Bible is actually about. Often, people who have never even been involved with a religion believe that the Bible is a rule book for how to achieve some kind of reward in the afterlife. We have all been exposed to the propaganda produced by religion, even if we have never been inside of a church. In the Bible, the God of punishment and reward is Satan. To those willing to read the Bible with an open mind and see it for what it actually is, it becomes quite obvious quite quickly that the Bible is simply a written record of the war between Satan and the Creator. This war is often presented as the war between the righteous angels and the wicked angels or the war between creation and civilization, or the war between God's kingdom and Satan's empire. If you look at all of the ancient bits and pieces of original Hebrew text, they're all a little bit different from one another, probably because of the extended amount of time over which they were produced. Over time, words and grammar change. To someone living during that process, the changes would have been easy to address. Since no one was working as a professional translator or printer at that time, probably most of what has been discovered 
would have been written by people making personal copies for their children and grandchildren. I am certain that many copies were produced by the priestly class, but thousands of years later it would be difficult to tell a priest copy of an Old Testament book from a sheep herder's copy. Contrary to popular belief, I am certain that sheep herders at the time were very literate. Being able to compare the differences in these ancient texts actually helps to confirm that the original ideas that God was communicating to mankind were preserved, at least up until about 2,700 years ago. After the Babylonians invaded and conquered Judah, everything changed. People over time forgot how to speak the language of Abraham and began to speak Babylonian. For some reason, the churches don't want anybody to know that parts of the Bible were originally recording, recorded in the Babylonian language. Even several quotes of Jesus that are found in our modern versions of the Bible contain English words that were translated from Babylonian words. Whenever ancient Babylonian text is found, it is called Chaldean because Babylon at one time was the center of what has become known as the Chaldean Empire. But in recent years, it has become a common practice to refer to any parts of the Bible that were originally recorded in Babylonian as Aramaic. The manipulation of the English language is nothing more than a theological propaganda tool. Aramaic Babylonian and Chaldean are all the same language. The Jews who were freed from the Babylonian Empire by the Persians spoke Babylonian. Babylonian would have been a major part of the language that everyone in Israel spoke all the way up until Babylon was conquered by Alexander the Great. Even the Samaritans who moved into the territory vacated by the trend northern tribes, and their Assyrian conquerors would have spoken a version of the Chaldean language. When the Greeks conquered Babylon, they called the language of the Jews Ebraisti, which is a Greek corruption of a word meaning language of Eber. Ebraisti, Strong's G1447, is the word that is rendered as Hebrew in the New Testament. Eber was the family head of Abraham's tribe. When Abraham entered the Promised Land, Eber was Abraham's great-great-great-great-grandfather. The language that would have been spoken by Ebram, Eber and Abraham is what most people think of as Hebrew but it is unlikely that anyone alive in Jesus' day would have been able to understand that language. What we call Hebrew today bears a much stronger resemblance to the language of Babylon than to the language of Abraham. The official language of the people of Israel currently would not have been understood by Abraham. Hebrew today is simply another corrupted version of Babylonian written with the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Just as the stars in our universe are recognized by the patterns that form our constellations, all alphabets, earthwide, were developed from those same star patterns. Babylon the Great, mentioned in the book of Revelation, is a direct reference to the stars in our nighttime sky, as well as the alphabets used by every nation on the earth. In effect, all biblical references to Babylon are direct references to the written languages of the world as they appear in the star patterns found in our nighttime sky. Not long after conquering Judah, Alexander the Great died unexpectedly. Without any governmental system in place to designate his replacement, several of his generals took it upon themselves to become the next ruler of the Greek Empire. Since none of the generals was willing to acknowledge any of the others as their new emperor, they started sending their soldiers off to murder one another. This government 
instability kept the region of the planet engulfed in carnal warfare for decades. About 200 years after Alexander's death, Ptolemy had what we today call the Old Testament translated into Greek. It was hoped that by doing so, he could instill a sense of patriotism into the Jewish citizens that lived in his part of the Greek Empire. The translation that was produced by Ptolemy is what we today call the Septuagint. It was apparently hoped that the Jews would see Ptolemy as the defender of the faith and assist him in his struggle for world domination. As the story goes, about 70 men were used to translate the ancient Hebrew text into the Bible, of the Bible, into Attic Greek. So as not to offend the Jews, they made a point of ensuring that nothing was done to their beloved book that could potentially anger the Jewish people. When compared to ancient Hebrew texts of the Old Testament, it appears as if the Septuagint is a very accurate translation. The Septuagint is the Bible that Jesus would have been familiar with. Every time that the Bible speaks of Jesus quoting the Old Testament, his words are identical to those found in the Septuagint. Had he been quoting any Hebrew text of the Old Testament or any of the other Greek text of the Old Testament, that would not be the case. Since the Septuagint was supposed to be a propaganda tool, Ptolemy had a few extra books inserted into its pages. These books are today are called the Deuterocanonicals and Apocrypha. They are all well known and are always in separate parts of the Bible and clearly labeled as different. These extra books all incorporate patriotic themed traditional stories of the Jewish religion. The misleading stories found in the Deuterocanonicals and Apocrypha are very similar to the traditional religious stories and patriotic propaganda taught by the churches today. The original Old Testament books that were translated into Greek are extremely trustworthy. The newer books that were inserted into the Septuagint are not. None of those books has ever been found in any catalog of the Old Testament produced prior to the time when Judah became a part of the Greek Empire. And none of the New Testament writers ever quoted them. Most people have no idea how our modern Bibles came to be. In evidence of that fact, many who watch my Bible videos will speak about how the Deuterocanonicals and Apocrypha have been removed from the Bible in order to hide the truth. It is true that bad things have been done to our Bibles in order to conceal truth. But since the Septuagint and other ancient language texts still exist, and many modern Bibles still include Ptolemy's extra books, it is not that difficult to read them and decide for ourselves if they really deserve any special attention. Every time that I read from the Bible, I discover another incredible spiritual truth to share with my friends. I cannot say that about anything that I have ever read out of the books that were added by Ptolemy. When Rome usurped the Greek Empire, those speaking Greek were eventually forced to learn Latin. The most popular Latin version of the Bible is what has become known as the Vulgate. In Latin, the Versio Vulgata, which roughly translates as common language version. It is at this point in history that the Catholic religion rose to power. This time around, Satan wasn't just going to have books added to the text, but was going to seriously alter the text itself. What makes this version of the Bible worse than the previous versions is that those doing the translating weren't just scholars deciphering some long dead language, they were bilingual speakers of both the Greek and Latin, meaning that they were fully aware of exactly what they were doing. The point that I'm trying to make is that the translation errors that they inserted into the text could not simply be dismissed as honest mistakes. Jerome and all others involved in the production of the Latin Vulgate intentionally mistranslated passages in such a way as to make it seem as if the Bible supported the teachings 
of Mithraism, the ancient religion practiced by Rome based on the mythologies of the previous world empires. The papas, or popes, who ruled over Rome were insanely evil men who worshipped Satan, the god of punishment and reward. As a result, the text of the Latin Vulgate was altered ever so slightly in such a way as to make it seem as if the god of punishment and reward was the creator. From that moment on, the Bible would become civilization's most powerful tool for controlling the masses. The hellfire Trinitarian God that had been established by the Egyptian Empire as Osiris, Horus, and Isis would now become firmly established as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of Christianity. As time went on, Latin became a dead language, just as Greek, as had Babylonian before that and Hebrew before that. Britain eventually ascended to power and Latin was replaced by English as the universal language of the empire. Although the Catholic Church resisted for a very long time the need for a new translation into the new language of the new empire had to be produced. Initially attempts were unsuccessful due to the fact that a whole bunch of people were aware that the Latin version was corrupted. As a result, church leaders demanded that the New English Version be translated not from the Latin, but instead from the original Greek language versions. It is unlikely that these men were motivated by a hunger for the truth, but simply wanted to make it publicly known that the religion of the British Empire was not going to be beholding to the religion of the Roman Empire that it was replacing. The British Empire wanted to create the myth that the religion of the masses would be based on the religion of Jesus and not on the religion of Rome. Since people understood that Jesus spoke Greek, they wanted a Bible based on the language that Jesus spoke. The problem was that the King of England worshipped the same Trinitarian hellfire god of punishment and reward that was being worshipped by the ruler of Rome. There was no way that King James was going to allow his subjects to worship the true God. The Bible of the Roman Empire had to somehow be preserved as the Bible of the British Empire. As a means of perpetuating the myth that the New Testament of the English Bible was a direct translation of the original language books, a Catholic theologian named Desiderius Erasmus translated the New Testament of the Latin Vulgate into Greek. Just so that you understand what I'm telling you. The original books of the Bible, which had been preserved in Greek, were eventually translated into Latin by Jerome, and rather than translate those original Greek language books into English, Erasmus translated the Latin books of the New Testament back into Greek, just so that King James could claim that his English Bible was not translated from Latin. All of the misleading verses that had previously been put into the Vulgate by Jerome were going to be put into the Textus Receptus by Erasmus. To this day, most of those altered verses can still be found in our modern Bibles. If King James had his Bible translated from the original documents as claimed, that would not be true. The Greek document produced by Erasmus, although very similar to the original language text of the Bible, had been seriously altered as a means of clouding the truth. This version became known as the Textus Receptus, which in English means the received text. Calling this fabrication the received text has successfully led many honest members of the Christian faith to believe that only Erasmus' version of the Greek text is directly from God. As a result, the version of the English Bible that was initially translated from that text is to this day treated in the very same way. 
Many people falsely believe that the end results produced by Erasmus and King James I of England are the only trustworthy Bible text that exists. King James named his Bible the authorized version for the same reason that Erasmus' New Testament was called the received text. Erasmus received his text from the Catholic Church. The authorized version was authorized by the ruler of Satan's empire. Neither version was received from or authorized by the true God. Living in our modern age, many over the course of the last 200 years or so have become aware of the problems with Erasmus received text and King James authorized version. And as a result, there are now many English translations of the Bible available for us to read. Unfortunately, even though quite a few of the more well-known errors have been corrected in our newer translations, quite a few of the unpublicized errors have not. The Western world, for the most part, is still involved in the religions of Christianity and Judaism, which are directly under the control of the God of punishment and reward. For the time being, this is still Satan's civilization. So until Christ returns to rid the earth of Satan and all of his religions forever, wickedness will continue to abound. Many alive today will go to their graves without ever finding out that their religions were lying to them about God's Word, the Bible. No matter how many people watch this video, listen to the audio file from this video, or read the transcripts of this video, most will disagree with what I am saying. I fully expect to receive many links to scholarly articles disputing what I am telling you here today. But unlike the mindless drones of Satan's empire, I don't depend on men with college degrees to tell me the difference between truth and lies. All of the versions of the Bible that I reference today, whether Hebrew, Greek, Latin, or English, are available online in multiple formats for anyone wishing to study them. For many years, I have dedicated myself fully to the task of uncovering as many Bible truths as possible so that I can share what I learn with others. As evidence of this fact is the information that you're listening to today. The King James English Version of the Bible, originally produced in 1611, that is supposed to be a direct translation of the original language ancient language text, can easily be compared to the Douay-Rheims Catholic Bible originally produced in 1610, which is based on the Latin text of Jerome. Unlike the Protestant religion that vehemently denies that the King James Version is based on the Latin Vulgate, the Catholic religion is proud of the fact that their Douay-Rheims is a direct translation of the Latin Vulgate, and yet the two for all practical purposes, are nearly identical. Anyone with an open mind who reads both will recognize that differences do exist between the two, but will also recognize that those differences are inconsequential when compared to the monumental differences that exist between the Douay, the King James, and the original ancient language text. The original original documents written by the authors of the books that are in our Bibles supposedly no longer exist. But even if they did, we would have no way of identifying them as such. That doesn't mean that we can never know what was in those books. Many ancient manuscripts of the books that make up our modern Bibles are still in existence. Although most are only partial, many being no more than a few lines of text, over the course of the last 200 years or so, many men have taken on the task of studying and documenting what each of those ancient manuscripts says. The goal being to put together a complete copy of the Bible that best represents the teachings that would have been contained in the books produced by the original writers. Most scholars agree that the best overall version of an ancient original language text of the New Testament 
was produced by two men named Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. These men painstakingly sorted through every piece of New Testament text that was available at the time, carefully copying every letter so that they might compare all known ancient copies of New Testament books against one another. The King James only team have put up an insane level of resistance to what Westcott and Hort produced based on nothing more than religious pride, human tradition, and a deep desire to please their God, which is a pretty good indication that Westcott and Hort got it right. Very little of what is taught by the King James only religionist can possibly be accurate. Under scrutiny, most of it is very obviously nonsensical. It would be really easy to produce hundreds of hours of video in defense of the Westcott and Hort text, but since people have been arguing over Erasmus versus Westcott and Hort since its introduction in 1881, quite a bit of information is already available, and there really isn't anything new that I could add to the discussion. Since its original introduction in 1881, several editions have been produced taking into consideration discoveries of ancient manuscripts that have come to light since its initial publication. And all of it is available to anyone that wants to research the Bible for themselves online, free of charge. If you read the entire Bible from cover to cover, without any preconceived notions, you will not find any of the foolish doctrinal teachings of the churches. You will come across all of those scriptures that the churches use as proof text of their doctrinal teachings, but when you do, you'll notice that none of them quite fit in with the rest of the Bible. You can simply accept that the verses that contradict the majority of the Bible are mistranslated, or you can research those contradictory verses yourself. It's not that difficult to find any questionable verses in their original Hebrew or Greek form and compare how the words that make up those verses are used at every other place in the Bible where they appear. Probably most who listen to this information will rush off to some King James only website in order to have their ears tickled. To those who have dedicated themselves to the God of religion, nothing is more uncomfortable than logic. The point of this video is not to defend any particular modern version of the Bible nor is it to expose the flaws that are found in any other English versions of the Bible. I already have a video series posted about that subject. But hopefully the information in this video will convince you that the truth can be had. In fact, the truth can be had from nearly any version of the Bible that exists, with few exceptions. If you want to believe in a Trinitarian hellfire God of punishment and reward, there are plenty of resources out there to help you along on your path to destruction. But if you wish to learn the truth about the Creator, all that you have to do is read the Bible, the entire Bible. Reading so-called Trinitarian proof text or hellfire proof text is not going to be enough. If you want to learn what's in the Bible, you have to read the entire Bible. And if you come across a verse that bothers you, you may need to stop long enough to do some research. For those who will fight to the death to maintain their relationship with the God of religion, there is still hope. One of the verses in our modern Bibles that has not been tampered with can be found at Acts chapter 24 and verse 1. I have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Those who are resurrected will very likely be ashamed of how they wasted their lives following the teachings of Satan's cults. But the joy that they will feel at being resurrected into fully functioning healthy bodies surrounded by all of their loved ones in a paradise garden will more than make up for any discomfort that they may feel about wasting their lives by being stupid. Even those who participated in the wars of the empire will be relieved to see that those who they killed will also be resurrected. 
right there in that very same paradise garden. If you don't want to survive, don't listen to me.